I'm Sasha Fisher, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of Spark Microgrants. I actually had the fortune of being in southern India uh, in 2009 on a study abroad program and saw an incredible group of women who had come together. They met every single week, and they were planning their own development projects. Um, this group of women were just remarkable. They had organized themselves out of a time of, of serious problems that they were facing, but you could feel their level of confidence and capacity, as well as their determination to create a better future for them and their children and families. And I thought that this energy that they had as a community was so powerful. And it was different from what I had seen in other countries when I spent time in East Africa, where communities were really sitting on the sidelines of development and not participating in the projects that were meant to help them. And I wanted to know how do we bring that energy that I was seeing in this community of women in southern India back to East Africa and help communities come together to take local action as a community. And since 2010, we've built out Spark Microgrants to serve some of the most remote communities in Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi to enable them to be the founders of their own development projects, not waiting for outside organizations to come in and prescribe solutions to their challenges, but actually enabling communities to design and launch their own social impact projects, whether it's schools or health centers or farms. Prior to India, I had spent some time in South Sudan and saw a ton of top-down prescriptive aid, aid organizations that were flooding in from the outside, building projects and leaving. And when those organizations left, they were often leaving the school buildings and the water taps to be managed locally, but nobody locally had the ownership to manage them. So what happened was school buildings would be left unused, water taps broken, nobody trying to fix them. And there was a real disconnect between how aid organizations were building projects and the idea of actually building communities and enabling communities to develop and launch their own projects. And so what it seemed like was that we were spending billions of dollars on prescriptive solutions that had short-term impact. And what we really needed was to enable communities to drive their own change. Um, and some organizations attempt to do this, right? They attempt to find an organization like the one I saw in India, where there's a local organization that already exists, and then you provide them funding. But what about the communities that aren't organized yet? The communities that don't have strong leadership yet, but have the potential to? That's why we designed Spark, to be able to reach out to those communities and be the step from zero to one, getting them organized for the very first time and helping them launch their very first project. We've since worked with 102 communities and just seen remarkable results in what communities do during that first project and then how they go on to launch secondary projects afterwards. We have built out the Spark approach to be a six month proactive facilitation process. So Spark trained facilitators, young university graduates from in country, from Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, reach out to rural villages and actually take the village through weekly community meetings where both men and women sit together and often for the very first time discuss as a community together what they want to see for their village in three years from now. And one of the things that we've streamlined throughout that process is making sure that both we're able to bring women's voices out, but also that we're helping men to listen to those women's voices, because that is just as important. And so the way that we facilitate our process is conducted in a way that ensures that women have space to participate and that the men are listening. So we'll host, for example, focus groups where um, men and women break out so there's more chances for women to be speaking in their focus group and then presenting to the group um, so that the whole community has to be listening to their ideas. And intentionally creating that space is really important. What we see from that is increased leadership um, that's taken up by women and increased respect in the whole community uh, by both men and women from the region, as well as the government. Make sure you're incredibly passionate about it and that you've got the right folks around you who are going to push you to succeed and that you admire just as much. This is a fascinating discussion that's happening right now and, and building off of 
a lot of what we've seen internationally, it's quite bizarre um, that we haven't figured this out here because internationally it's, it's well known that if you give uh, money or if you give uh, a loan to somebody, no matter what the country is, a woman is going to provide a better return and, and make sure that money is spent on good things like the family. Um, and that's, that's pretty much known across the board. So it's, it's incredible that we could be having the discussion now about how do we bring more woman leadership and, and stronger woman leadership within organizations here in America and in other countries. Um, I think it's, it's long overdue. But I think what's important for us to remember is not just to have women be able to gain confidence and speak up more, but that within institutions, within organizations, and within the government, we have to provide the space to bring women's voices out and to appreciate them because they're not just because it's a woman's voice, but because it's a valuable perspective that you need to effectively run that organization or to make sure that your government is representative of the people in your district.